Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Seth Godin and Erwin Miller to our series. We invite you to visit our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations much like this. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is Live Talks LA. Seth Godin's new book is The Practice, Shipping Creative Work. Seth is the author of 18 international bestsellers that have changed the way people think about work and have been translated into 38 languages. Among them is Unleashing the Idea Virus, Permission Marketing, Purple Cow, Tribes, The Dip, Lynchpin, Poke the Box, and All Marketers Are Liars. Erwin is a principal and design director at Gensler. He has served as a firm-wide lifestyle leader, global retail practice area leader, and a studio director, and currently the museums and culture practice area leader. I am Ted Haptigaber, founder and producer of the series, and towards the end, I will pose a few questions for Seth as well. I'll let you take it from here, Erwin. Thank you. Uh, good to have you. Good to have you both here, and good to talk to you, Seth, this morning. I, as I said a moment ago, but I'll say again, I really love the book. It was fantastic. I read through it yesterday. It was right up my alley, as, as of course I'm in the creative field. I think we know a lot of the same people out there, so really enjoyed it. Um, the the way it's organized, the half page increments, uh, it's just very digestible. It's, it's a great read. Uh, but let's unpack. First things first, shipping, creative work, because um, a lot of times when that shipping comes up, I'm trying to get my head around it. So talk to us about what that is before we dive too deep. Yeah, great place to start. And Ted, thanks for having me. Um, the subtitle is shipping, creative work, because all three words have magical power. Shipping, because if you keep it to yourself, that's fine. You can get satisfaction, but you're not doing professional work. Shipping means bringing something you made to other people to serve them. Creative, because creative is not following the manual, not doing what you're told, not simply being a cog in the machine. If you have a job where you're not allowed to be creative, then they're going to replace you as fast as they can with someone cheaper than you. So I love uh, the work Gensler does. I love the guitars in the background, but creative is not necessarily using a pencil or a spoke shave or writing an opera. Creative is solving an interesting problem in a way that hasn't been solved before, being human and generous and doing something that might not work. And the last part of this trilogy is work because it's not your hobby. I love hobbies, you should have a hobby, but as soon as you decide to sell it, it's work and it's not for you anymore. It's to make a change in the world. And to show up as a professional is a choice and you can get better at it. Great. So by the opera I've been working on the last 10 years, I, sh I should throw that away as what I'm hearing. No, it's um, great. I'm just saying for people who haven't written an opera, I can help you too. Exactly. I'm not going to write one. Um, I was struck by the idea. You, you seem to talk to a higher purpose in this book. That was so evident throughout the book. Um, and I don't mean it from a religious sense throughout the book, perhaps um, a spiritual sense, but through um, not just about the delivery of work, creativity, um, the self-indulgence indulgence of talent or skill, but it's a higher meaning you talk about to be of service, making the world a better place through art. Talk to us about that because it's something that, that took me uh, away and, and kept going throughout the book. So you mean it. I, I, I do. I think there's two forms of fuel that creatives have found. One form of fuel is that you have a chip on your shoulder, that you have an insatiable hole in your soul, and that you need to fill it by self anger self-aggrandizing behavior, that you're constantly looking for more. And the problem with this fuel, as my friend Brian Koppelman says, is it doesn't burn clean. That anger and revenge don't usually end up where you need to be. And the other kind of fuel, which I've seen from so many people who do creative work, is how can I be of service? That if you can figure out how to turn that into your fuel, it turns out you can do better work and you can walk lighter through the world as you do. That you can identify problems that need to be solved for other people. So yeah, there's musicians who can turn their back to the audience and play just for themselves. But the ones that we end up uh, having narrate our lives and who create real magic, they're the ones who are there for us. Yeah, it's, it, it was that transition from uh, for yourself and for, for someone else you talk about. Once you embrace that idea, it kind of frees you up, doesn't it? It kind of lets you do something for someone else and maybe takes the pressure off your own, own self. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot in the book is this idea of imposter syndrome and holding back and who am I to do this? 
And if you think about being a lifeguard, lifeguards in the moment don't say, well, there's someone better qualified than me to save this person's life, right? The lifeguard jumps in the water because they're right there. And in this world of internet connection, each of us is right there. So who will we choose to help? Because if not us, then who? Yeah, you know, it's a perfect segue into this question about um, writer's block. You talk about that, and I think you mean writer's block in the sense of whatever your creative output is, not necessarily writing books. Um, but I, the book gives you permission to start wherever you are, which I love. And that's something I, I find that as a mantra with my teams and people I work with, but just put it on paper, do it. Why, would, why wouldn't you start right now? You say, simply begin. And then out of that, we can get into the flow. And that's an outcome of this. Let's talk about that, that idea of when you should start and, and why should you? Yeah. So uh, our mutual friend, Jill Greenberg, uh, perhaps the greatest photographer of her generation, people look at Jill's work and they say, well, she's got it going on. She must have been touched by the muse. I could never achieve that. And one of my prized possessions is the picture she took of me in 1977 when she had no right to be taking pictures. She was 14 years old. And that's how everyone who does creative work begins. Everyone begins in a moment of incompetence. Everyone begins with a snapshot because the, we don't say, I'll wait till I'm good and then I'll do it. We do it and that's how we get good. And the same way you learn to ride a bike or speak or walk is the way you learn to do any of these things because none of them are talents, they're skills. And we get there by doing the work and then owning it, not the other way around. Yeah, and you're putting it out there. I mean, since you mentioned Jill, one of the things that happens is because her work is so specific, when you see someone who uses similar lighting to Jill, a similar camera effect or something like that, and she doesn't use camera effects, she will text each other and her friends will always send her things. And sometimes it's just funny. It's just, I saw it, it's not my work. And it's, it doesn't have that edge. It doesn't have that extra bit that's there. And we're gonna get to that a little bit later about what that extra bit is. Um, you speak about trying to, you write about trying to make the existing narrative true. Um, now more than ever with kind of curated social media feeds and this feedback loop, we're getting whatever we're talking about that moment is suddenly in front of us and it's self-fulfilling. I remember Obama talking about the feedback loop of if you're only going to follow your people on Instagram, you're only going to hear your political views put back to you. Um, so uh, we're in a big position of how, how do you go beyond this right now? How do we push beyond that narrative to think beyond ourselves? And what are tools we could use to get there? Okay, well, so if I'm going to rant for just one minute, Let's sure. remind ourselves that if you are using social media and you're not paying, you're not the customer, you're the product. That yeah. the social media companies make money making us feel insecure. They make money pushing us to fit in. And most of all, they make money telling us someone's talking about us behind our back. We better go check to see what they're saying. And if these things aren't helping you do the generous work you want to do, then stop. And there's lots of things that creative people should stop and this might be one of them. That the work is not, how do I put myself into this momentary state of dissolution? The work is how do I isolate myself enough from whoever's poking me in this moment to do something that people will look at in a year or 10 years from now? How do I show up to actually solve a creative problem not to deal with breaking news? And I was telling someone the other day, I don't think Wolf Blitzer has a greatest hits a DVD. And if he did, no one would watch it because no one wants to see breaking news from four years ago. It right. doesn't matter to us. Yeah. What we need to figure out is what are the places we can go mentally or online where we are inspired to contribute because the dominant narrative of the day is not our job. Our job is to invent the culture. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I thought it was mostly about the, the tonal range of Wolf Blitzer always stays the same too, is why we also wouldn't want to watch this DVD. And God bless Wolf Blitzer. Thank you for bringing us the news. Um, do what you love. Man, I hate that statement. I hate that notion. I, it just seems so lazy. It's just, you write it off and you, you turn it around and you said, love what you do is the mantra for, for um, professionals. Talk to us about the distinction about those two. So, all the successful creatives I know love this riff. And the people who I know who are unsuccessful and unhappy creatives hate this riff. And I think that tells us a lot. 
right? Love what you do is a fairly recent phenomenon. No one said it to the dish diggers. No one said it to the people on the factory line in Manchester. Nobody said it, you know, when you were marching off to war. But recently, love what you do is apparently the compass. And that's what your hobby should be. You should say, this is my authentic version of me. I made this for me. But that's not available to people who want to do a useful contribution. Instead, we have this opportunity to do the work and then we have a choice. And the choice can be, we can decide to love it. We can decide to love showing up to make this shift happen, regardless of our tools, regardless of where we are sitting or what our job title is. And the beauty of it is it's so resilient because if your habit is to love what you do, then you're always in love because whatever you're doing, you can love it. Whereas if you wanna be a diva and a prima donna and you have to say, nope, it's not what I love. Bring me something else. You're going to spend most of your days in dissatisfaction. Yeah, I mean, it directly connects to process, which you talk quite a bit about. And I am, you know, like I said, I'm a RISD person. So I'm a big process oriented person. I was educated and, and that kind of education is the process is as important as the outcome. Whatever the outcome is, could be some nice thing. Awesome. But if you're the, the process along the way that got you there is really key. Um, what is what are the differentiators between good processes, lazy processes, and how do we how do we get into the groove of knowing what is the right kind of process, if that's a if that's a question I can ask, to drive us to an outcome that could be more positive? Yeah, it, you know it's interesting. Um, I I lived in Silicon Valley for a year, uh, and I'm not particularly uh, au courant there, and haven't been for a long time. And one of the reasons is that people who, many people, not all, many people who have succeeded there, succeeded because they showed up and got lucky, not because they understand the domain. Mm -hmm. And doing the reading, understanding the genre, seeing what has come before, figuring out what your mise en place looks like, understanding who has come before you, being able to explain why something you did worked these are all hallmarks of somebody who is mindful and clear about their practice. The opposite is somebody who feels defensive because they don't know why they got lucky and they're frustrated because they're not getting lucky again. And uh, I did an interview uh, for American Express years ago with a famous fashion designer. And I was nervous about it because I don't know a lot about the fashion industry. And so I read this person's autobiography. They actually had two autobiographies. And I was asking questions and it became clear within a couple of minutes that not only hadn't they written their autobiographies, they hadn't read them. And they had basically just been careening through life and every once in a while had hit something that worked. And that's fine. And if you get lucky, congratulations. But I don't think you should take credit for much more than showing up and getting lucky. I would rather say I have a practice and it might not have had a home run, but I'm proud of the practice and I know how to do my practice. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain ethic about that. I, I spent time with Brian Eno years ago in Graz, Austria, and he said, Erwin, the, the most dangerous thing you could do is, is get lucky once and have to repeat that the rest of your life because that's what everyone's wanting of you. And how do you break out of that? And it was fascinating to think about. And I, I mean, are you, are you disheartened or worried about, I mean, it is a different world now for the last, I'm sorry, but for the last 20 or 30 years of what you used to do for process. I remember, um, you know, working in restaurants where if you were told to peel 200 carrots, you peel 200 carrots perfectly because that's what your job was, or you mowed the lawn right, or these kind of things. There are quicker ways to go around all these types of things I think we're seeing. Um, what, do you, what do you think the future holds as far as you see, or are there methods to bring back some of that? Well, in so I remember the first packaging project I worked on, they had to cut a ruby lith. And you know what cutting a ruby lith is, but most of mm -hmm. the people who are watching this don't. Yeah. Uh, a ruby lith is a, a piece of film that you have to very carefully cut with scissors to block off certain colors so that when you're making something, it pops off. Now you just use the lasso in Photoshop and you're done, yeah. or maybe you don't even have to do that. So you could say, well, life was better when we had to cut a ruby lith, but I'm not sure it was. And so. For me, process doesn't mean that new technology is a bad thing. Process means that you have in mind uh, intentional action, design thinking, who's it for and what's it for, that you have a compass, 
that you regularly have a way to use whatever technology is available to you to show up in the world. And Hollywood has a real problem with this because every time technology changes, the lucky people in Hollywood don't know what to do because they don't have a compass. They just know a few people and they can turn a crank and maybe make some money. And then all of a sudden it's not movie theaters, it's Netflix. Well, oh no, what are we gonna do? Well, if you, have a comp if you have a compass, if you have a method, if you have a way to say, how am I going to serve people now that the middlemen have changed? It's no problem, I got this. And I was listening to Ron Howard talk um, this morning about this. And Ron has made documentaries and Ron has done you know, big box office movies and other movies that critics have beloved. He understands that the technology keeps changing, the cast of characters he works with keeps changing and that's okay because the process isn't, I need this exacto knife. The process is, I have a North Star. Yeah, um, let's talk about educating or nurturing or growing others, because a lot of this we talked about so far is what you could do as yourself as a creative. Um, can you share the story about Dave Grohl's mom and just finding, finding that creative aspect and why do you nurture that at that age? I just, it was so moving to hear that. Yeah, well, I mean, Dave, his mom has written perhaps the best-selling book ever written by the mother of a rock star. And in it, she interviews the mothers of a whole bunch of other rock stars. And they talk about what is it like and how did their role make a difference. And what we've discovered is that at some point in your life, having a cohort, a community, somebody who says not, I'm reassuring you, but I've got your back somebody who raises the bar for you is so vitally important. And maybe you weren't lucky enough to go up with Dave Grohl's mom. So what you gotta do instead is go find that group. Go find that group and organize it if no one's already organized it. Find four up and comers who some people might think of as competitors and start that circle. That circle that challenges the others and counts on the others and keeps the connection going regardless of the speed bumps, because we live in culture and we live in community. And it's, there's a myth of the overlooked starving artist who no one understands, but even Vincent van Gogh had a brother who looked out for him, right? And that's what we need to find is who are the others who are gonna be along for the ride? Yeah, it's so important. There's a lot of talk about writing about um, this generosity we need to have because you're, you're right when you think creatives you think of that sole person who's coming up with that and they're doing it and 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 then you get into cohorts and generosity there was one part about a uh, hoarding knowledge uh, people can serve their insights or great ideas um, which I, I've witnessed you know we've all witnessed those moments of do I share this is this the one great thing that was my big idea but what you find is, I think you set up, you feel empowered at the end of this book where you're this endless well, where you could put out more and more. So why don't you just start right now? But uh, maybe talk to me about hoarding knowledge and why do people do that? And what's the, what's the end game, do you think? So I've written 7,700 blog posts in a row for free. And Thank I you. will keep doing it for as long as I can. Every time I write a blog post, I come up with a something I don't have to spend a year of my life writing a book about because I was able to share it. So it's off my plate and I can work on the next thing. Every once in a while, I write something that creates a multi-billion dollar industry. That's fantastic. And there's plenty to go around that you learn to live in surplus when you don't hoard your ideas. If you know that tomorrow you need to say one more generous thing to people, something will arise because you don't want to show up tomorrow empty handed. And the people who are hoarding, what they discover maybe is that if their hands are busy grasping that old idea, they don't have any room left for the new one. And this additive nature makes such a difference. You know, my, my friend, Fred Wilson, who's the most successful VC in New York City has been blogging every day, every weekday for a decade or more. And he gives away all his best ideas. And as a result, he finds better investors, better partners, better entrepreneurs. The more you give away, the more it comes back. Maybe that doesn't work for magicians. But other than that, it's hard for me to think of many professions where you come out ahead by not telling people something that might help them. Yeah. So for the magicians watching this feed, uh, apologies for that. Um, also, generationally, you've, you've lived through enough to see 
I find, I've got three sons who are 19 and younger, um, Gen Z and generationally, they just don't give a crap about unsharing. They're, they're willing to put things out there, share, collaborate, create, you know, Minecraft, Roblox universes. And, and so I think, aren't you noticing, we grew up in an era where you had to have that great idea and you were gonna become successful and you're gonna be a millionaire and all those things that we probably heard in your life. Um, now it's more this collaborative spirit I'm seeing, especially with people I work with too. Are you seeing that? Yeah, and the, but the people who, and you know, we still live in a scarcity-driven, unfair, indoctrination-based capitalist system where scarcity creates some level of value. Mm -hmm. The question is, where is the scarcity? And I think the scarcity has shifted from, I'm a car dealer and I know more about cars than you, the customer, because that's not true anymore, because I can just bring my laptop to the dealership and I know everything you know about the pricing, to I have trust and I have community. That if you are a community organizer who is trusted, you have something scarce. And so people who are showing up in community to lead are able to cause more change to happen than people who are simply taking. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I love this, um, you're writing about, there's two stories I wanna share. The, this kind of outlier moments or situation, you talk about the fifth hammer um, in relation to Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. And those are the things I look for. Those are the, those things, whether you're, um, you know, when you're watching Queen's Gambit, you're looking for this thing of someone exceptional did something extra on their show that some other show didn't have, or there's yeah. a book you read or something. Tell us about that story and what, what is that fifth element? Because I want to relate it to this Hamilton story after. Yeah, and I would love to talk about uh, Queen's Gambit because I don't watch TV, but I saw that. And oh, yeah. uh, so I have something to say about that. Okay, so first we'll talk about Pythagoras, the guy who invented the triangle. Yeah. Um, he was a little bit of a nut. He had this whole thing about chickpeas that we could get into, but we won't. And one of the things he did was he was walking through the village and he passed a blacksmith shop. And from the blacksmith shop, he heard all the blacksmiths and many times humans and other animals in groups will get into sync. And he hears them in sync, all hitting their blacksmith hammers. And it makes a beautiful sound. So because he's Pythagoras, he runs into the shop and grabs everyone's hammers and takes them, five hammers. And he then proceeds to weigh them. And he discovers harmonics. He discovers that four of the hammers that sounded so beautiful together are exact increments of each other in weight. And the fifth hammer was off. And it turns out that that, in many cases, makes a more beautiful sound than if everything is strictly in harmony, that you needed that little bit that didn't quite fit. And then I tell the story of Crosby, Stills and Nash slash Young, because the three of them were in perfect harmony. But Neil Young, who came from away, from a different country, who wouldn't fly on the group plane, whose voice was rarely in tune, who wrote songs that didn't matter. It was when Young was part of the quartet that the quartet broke every record because it was the fifth hammer that changed things. And so when we think about Scott Page's work on diversity and we think about um, the all clarinet orchestra of Berkeley, California, because there isn't an all clarinet orchestra because it would sound terrible. We realize having different backgrounds and points of view in the room is necessary. It actually is additive, it creates magic, whereas when everyone is complete in a complete agreement and in lockstep, it's sort of boring. Yeah, I mean, it's that you mentioned Hollywood earlier, we could still talk about music and, and you mentioned Steely Dan and, and there's that aspect of like, you can reach for that perfection and have the most polished, perfect thing. But for many of us, I think, you know, from an intellectual standpoint, you hear it and you go, that's really nice. You get it. And, and I think I can relate this story. It was the opening at the same time of Hamilton when it first debuted on Broadway and the resurgence of West Side Story, the reimagining of it, and the difference between the two. And what I took from that was Hamilton had that fifth hammer. It had that grit of this other. It did something no one else did by the quality of the cast, by the rap music, by the, the, the mix of it all, by the setting, uh, the staging of it, and that theater, too. I think all those things add up to creating something different. And those are the moments we look at that are memorable. Yeah. And so West Side Story had no defects. Everyone knew their lines. The lighting was the best I've ever seen. The, the screen 
was impossibly bright. The cast was fine, but it didn't have the quality of magic. They forgot to add that last part. And the quality of magic is the riskiest part and the part that's often overlooked because we're so busy trying to polish it and to make it quote, perfect. But in fact, it's the parts that aren't perfect that enable us to create magic. Uh, you know, since we mentioned it and you smiled when I said it, let's go to this. Um, I found Queen's Gambit to be tremendously generous that they spent 10 years, when you go to the back, I didn't know this, but of course you're like, this is a quality product, someone did something great. Then I read the articles of it was 10 years in the making and the research and the, the chess moves and the things they didn't need to do. They clearly added things that there was a layer that you just didn't need to have in there. It set the bar to this level of supreme generosity because it gave you much more than you needed for a Netflix series. Yeah, so I talk about genre in the book and it it under it makes some people unsettled because they think it means generic and it doesn't. Genre is we can't know what your movie is until we watch it. And we can't know what your book is until we read it. We can't know what your consulting firm actually does until you do the work. So what are we buying? We're buying the box it comes in, the genre. If you say it's a superhero movie and we want to see a superhero movie, that's what we're going to go see. And the creative work is not denying genre. It's acknowledging it, embracing it, and then going right to the edge of it. So whoever was the driving force behind uh, Queen's Gambit said, look, this show is going to get made. And we could say, it's a Netflix show. It's eight episodes, enjoy yourself. Or we go right to the edge. And every time we have to make a difficult decision that will cost us time or money, that will be risky, that will be a, a Philip, an extra, we're gonna choose to do it because we wanna not just make a Netflix show in this box. We're gonna go right to the edge of this box. We're gonna lose some people. Some people are gonna say, whoa, this is too unsettling in episode one or two where she becomes a drug addict or this is, too intellectual where they're arguing about various chess moves. Fine, it's not for you, go away. We're not trying to make the most popular Netflix show. We're trying to make a Netflix show that you're gonna remember five years from now. And if those decisions were easy decisions, they wouldn't matter anymore. It worked because in each case, they were hard decisions to make. Which song should we pay the extra money for? And we're gonna pick one that I'm betting the showrunner is gonna push back on, we'll have the argument because we're making something that matters. Yeah, it's really going beyond that and not the, it's like that phenomenological understanding of the minute I name something and say, this is what it is, I got it, it's a jug. It looks like a jug to me. So um, there have been a lot of books um, we've covered on this series and, and about saying yes and saying no. And you talk about this idea, there were two, um, notions you mentioned, the hell yeah and the deep yes, and when you focus and why you need to do that. Tell us about that kind of control we all need as creatives to be out there in the world and make decisions. Yeah, so uh, the hell yes comes from my friend Derek Sivers. And uh, the thing is, it is easier than ever to ask somebody for five minutes. And it is easier than ever to say, will you hop on a Zoom call? And it's easier than ever to say, oh yeah, I'll be on Twitter too, and I'll be on Facebook. What Kevin Kelly teaches us is if somebody's asking you to do something three months from now, wonder if you would be eager to do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what I said when I chose not to go on Twitter all those years ago is what are you gonna get worse at if you're gonna add one more thing to your plate to be okay at? And in my case it was, well, I could become a mediocre blogger and a mediocre Twitter user, or I could spend all my time trying to be really good at this. And so saying no, when not because we're afraid, but because we want to expose ourselves to the fear of the thing we're saying yes to is the hallmark of a professional to say, I don't need that many boats and I'm burning the ones I don't have because having an easy escape hatch and another distraction, uh, you know, if you find yourself checking your email in the middle of a brainstorming session, something's wrong really poor brainstorming session that you're done with. Um, you write about enrollment and this idea, I think you share the idea of the Dorothy's yellow brick road, she's going down and everyone's joining along. I think it's so relevant to what most of us do, which is finding those moments. I talked to another author 
some months ago when he was talking about a win-win-win scenario. So it's not just for you, it's not for the other, but you're doing something better in the world with John Mackey. And I think this struck me as something similar in the sense of why is it important to look for that? Because um, what could it grow in ourselves and what are we offering? Right. So uh, Wizard of Oz, I could talk about all day long. Uh, one of the only movies uh, until recent days that featured a female protagonist who was the hero, particularly a young woman. Um, but one of the key lessons is she never ever has to cajole the lion or the tin man to keep going because they are enrolled in the journey. Mm -hmm. They are going because they decided to go. And when you are working with people who are enrolled in the journey, you don't have to keep crowd pleasing. And in Bob Dylan's fictional autobiography, he talks about his decision after the motorcycle accident to say to the uh, promoter, I wanna to go to the same cities three years in a row. And the promoter said, that's absurd. No, no rock band does that. You gotta give them time to recover so that they'll all come back next time. He said, no, I wanna go three years in a row. And here's the reason why. The first year, the people who want the old Bob Dylan will come and I'll piss them off. And the second year, people who are hoping that that was a phase will come and I'll really piss them off. But the third year, the people who get the joke will bring their friends. And then I will have the audience that I want. And he got the enrollment of a smaller group than he would have had by far a smaller group by instead of saying, let me give them what the masses want, saying, I'm going over here, come with me if you wanna come. Yeah, there's a lot that you expand on um, in the future chapters about um, kind of growing a percentage of your audience, finding that first thousand people. Um, there's a Greta Gerwig story about, you know, once you're, once you're inclined to love Greta Gerwig's movies, you're going to see Little Women because it's her movie, but you're going to get something out of it. You talked about Ron Howard before, and I did his master class because I like his films and I like his documentaries, and I'm figuring I'd love to know what you're thinking. So, you know, getting people on board um, and influencing them enough to be want to be a part of it is really important. Yeah, exactly. And it's hard. Uh, it's really hard because all the push, the reason we live in a mass market culture is that the system wants us to have a hit. And, you know, I've never had a blog post win the internet, never once. And I'm thrilled at that. It makes my life so much easier. I've never had uh, one of my business books sell and sell and sell for years in a row. Fine. Because I don't want to come up with something that everyone thinks is a good idea. I want to come up with something that someone is glad I did. Yeah, no, I love that. Um... There was one part that really calmed me down. I think people enjoy in the book, this attachment to the outcome. And it's because um, I'm someone who overthinks everything. So I always am going to think about the next 10 steps ahead. And I need that person to say to me, does it matter? Will it change it? You talk about the weather. Can you explain what, what's this idea and what could we learn you know, about how we think about things in the future that we can't control? So I've been thinking about how to explain attachment a lot. So I've got come up with a new one. Let me try this out on you and you tell me if it resonates. Let's say... Well, first, here's the problem that people have when you talk about non-attachment. So you don't care. You don't care if the car is going to, your design is going to get good mileage. You don't care if the bridge is going to fall down. You don't care if your book is going to sell. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about attachment. Right. Let's say you and a friend decide to swim across a lake together. Well, if you really want attachment to the two of you going together, what you would do is measure 10 feet of rope four times, arm to arm, leg to leg, tie each other to each other and swim in unison. The problem with that kind of attachment is you're gonna drown. Whereas if you are swimming on your own, the best way you know how to swim, not trying to control how the other person swims, simply swimming your swim, mm -hmm. but aware of what's in the water, aware of where your friend is, the odds that the two of you are gonna make it across the lake go way up because you can want an outcome, but being attached to it, defining yourself by it, holding, wrapping yourself up in it is a guarantee of imposter syndrome, of fear, of paralysis, of writer's block, all of those things. Because what we're saying is I'm willing to do it if you promise it's gonna work. And we can't promise it's gonna work. So therefore you're not willing to do it. And my, shortest riff on this is what would you do if you knew you would fail? Because 
what's worth doing even if it's not going to work? Because if you set out to do it that way, then having it work is a wonderful upside, but you're not attached to it. It doesn't, uh, it's not required for the project to be worth doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a, a few more things. I know Ted's gonna have some questions at the end. Um, tell me if there's a big one for the world I inhabit. And we have this discussion quite a bit in our design directors back again, sir, is about choosing clients and why we need to choose good or great clients. And um, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So tell me your thoughts. So I first bumped into Gensler 20, 25 years ago when they sponsored something I was involved in at Fast Company. And so there's a long history in my limited understanding of the firm of deciding which kind of clients you want. When you pick your clients, you pick your future. That the difference between a great graphic designer and a good one is not how good they are with a Ruby list. It's who are their clients. And you don't move from good to great by working harder. You move from good to great by having better clients, by becoming the kind of person that great clients want to hire. Because great clients don't want what good clients want. Good clients want you to be fast and cheap and easy to replace. Yep. Great clients happily pay extra, tell other people that they hired you, but demand a whole new level of insight and art from you. And the best way to get great clients is to fire your good ones. You've got to say to somebody, particularly your bad ones, you got to say to your bad clients, no room for you on my schedule anymore. I am going to change the people I am trying to serve. And I don't want to serve you anymore because you are asking me to do something that doesn't give me what I need. Here's the phone number of four people you could hire instead of me. Yeah, luckily some of that is a self-fulfilling prophecy about, you know, in Hollywood, as you do better work, you get better opportunities, you, you grow from that, um, you know, writing books and the same with architecture and design. So hopefully some of that happens, but you're absolutely right. It's understanding the disconnection of the, um, if you keep on doing something the same way, it's not going to change. And you're not going to change. You're not going to bring these people to be at the level you want when their intentions just aren't there. Um, one or two last um, things. Um, you talk about people growing their audience. I want to read this quote, finding their audience, you say, and it's this idea of this gravitas you bring to this book. When you trust yourself enough to turn pro, you're entering into a covenant with those you seek to serve. You promise to design with intention and they to agree to engage with your work and the promise you bring them. And that's exactly what you're talking about there. I think it's, we need to raise our standards, those listening and those creatives, and we need the clients and those we serve to need to raise those standards. And it's kind of a, a partnership on how you get there. Yeah, um, you know, I, I miss Keith Jarrett and I hope he's doing okay. But um, if you went to see Keith Jarrett at Carnegie Hall, there were vast vats of Ricola at the end of every aisle. And when you sat down, people would, people would lean over and they'd say, don't make any noise when he's playing because he'll walk out on us. Because I've seen him walk out. He would walk out on the audience because he discovered that when he was playing the upbeat stuff, everyone was leaning in. And when he tried to get more melodic, he could hear people coughing. He could hear people rustling. And he's like, look, I'm communing here with my piano, with the muse and with you. And if you're not part of the deal, I'm out of here. And by establishing that as his standard, he changed the behavior of the audience. And he said, look, if you wanna be here to be part of it, you are part of it. Otherwise I'll just make it in the studio, but we're making this together live. And part of the deal is don't cough because I yep. know what the coughing means. It doesn't mean you have a, a, a sore throat. It means you're impatient with me. And I need more than that from you. Yeah, and it's communicating to that individual of how you want to be perceived and what you want to get. Let me do one last one because I know we've got a few questions. Um, talent and skill, we'll end on that because those were two. Uh, you explained it to me in a different way than I've thought about it before. But yes, the number one thing you get when you take a, Jill and I have had the talk, when you take a good photo is what camera do you use? You have a lot of talent. There are these good, these, these memes we all go to and, and those are the ones we solve it because it makes us comfortable and we understand it. What are the big differentiators? Because you have that great quote from Steve Martin of, from his book, Born Standing Up, I'm guessing, which was just, I had no skill. I had no talent, you know? I just came to this, so. Yeah, the words matter so much. And I know I'm in the word business, but I refuse to use the word talent when I mean skill. Talent is what you're born with. And it's a gift. And please don't waste it. But skill is a choice. And the reason people 
prefer to talk about talent is it lets them off the hook. Because if you haven't created the thing, well, it's because you have no talent. You didn't get the gift. This is nonsense. I have studied thousands of successful creatives and the only thing they have in common is skill. Talent doesn't show up because there's no relationship to a million years of DNA and the idea of using a camera. Where did that come from? Of course not, right? So instead we say, do you care enough? And I have a blog post coming out tomorrow about Bruce Springsteen. I just read his autobiography. He was so bad at playing the guitar. He had to quit his guitar lessons. He had no talent. He was so bad at singing. Every group he was in for the first five years had someone else do the singing because he couldn't sing. Not only that, he didn't even know how to drive until he was in his 20s. So all of the things that we imagine of that person being blessed and they're the popular kid in high school driving the, the, the sports car around and all, none of it. Charisma, charisma isn't a talent, it's a skill. All of these things are things we can choose to do. I think that's great news because it means it's up to us. Yeah, and this Springsteen, he's, he's, he's doing well in life, this guy you mentioned. <laughs> he worked it out, he really did. Well, I, I, will, I will tell you one last story before we let yeah, yeah, no, please. Head rise. Yeah. So years, years and years ago, I made a, a film with Isaac Asimov and um, we, I was instructed that the, the, the crew needed jackets. That was a tradition in Hollywood. You gotta get jackets with everything. Yeah. So I hired this guy, Storm and Norman, who's the number one maker of jackets in New York City. And Storm and Norman's this profane guy. He's got the warehouse, they're sewing there and the whole thing. And I go to pick up the jackets and he's on the phone screaming at the guy. He says, it's Springsteen with two E's, idiot. <laughs> and apparently they had made a whole bunch of Bruce Springsteen tour jackets as if Bruce uh, was uh, from the lost tribe of Israel. But that's a- Exactly. Is that, well, we, we like to think he is sometimes, or I do so. Thank you so much, Ted. Do you, do you want to ask a few questions? I have 10 more, but I'm happy to turn it back over to you. So um, I'll ask a couple and then I'll let you do have a closing question to wrap with. Hey, uh, thanks. Um, so um, a few questions, uh, Seth, real quick. Pivoting. We've heard this word now endlessly for the last 10 months. Um, uh, could you dive into a little bit um, how you see that might apply to a, a creative in this time? So the first thing they teach you in business school and one of the only useful lessons is to ignore sunk costs. A sunk cost is something that maybe you paid a lot of time and money for, but isn't something you need right now. So a law degree is a sunk cost. If you're 30 years old, you hate being a lawyer, you can't get a job as a lawyer, don't make your life miserable simply because you have to defend your degree. The way to think of a sunk cost is that it is a gift from your former self to your present self. And you do not have to accept it any more than you have to start serving fondue just because someone gave you a fondue set one day. And so what that means in times of change is I get it. You were really good at being in the office. That's a gift from the old you. I get it that uh, these assets you built over time were valuable to you and now they're not. So you need to say thank you to your former self. Thank you for offering me this, but no thanks. I'm going to go build a new thing. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, I mean, many of your followers are entrepreneurs and um, readily see how this applies to me as, you know, owner of a small company. How does the practice work well in a larger entity, say in like a place like Gensler? Well, uh, let's remember that Western Union turned down Alexander Graham Bell and all of the patents on the telephone because they were a monopoly. They won. They were winning. The stock price was fine. What do they need something new for? Because Western Union decided they were in the telegraph business, not in the business of using the trust that they had earned with people around communications to continue in the practice of moving that forward. And when we see you know, look at the, uh, the Fortune 100 or the Fortune 500. The churn on that list is enormous. Big companies keep disappearing and they disappear because they forget to ignore sunk costs. And they ignore, they embrace sunk costs because they are uncomfortable with having a practice. They're uncomfortable with 
realizing that they have to keep being in a new business as opposed to defending the old one. And I, I mean, I was just talking to someone just the other day who was in the conference business. When are things gonna get back to normal so we can make money from real life conferences again? And my answer to them was, wait a minute, we just advanced by five years, people connecting without regard to geography. There are all these disconnected people who wanna connect right this minute around something they care about. Why isn't that an opportunity for you? And do you really think that we're ever going back to normal the way it used to be? It's never once happened before. We're not gonna go back to the Model T. We're not gonna go back to uh, you know, coal powered fire plant, power plants. It's the same thing. So big organizations have to say, yeah, our bills get paid because we do what we did yesterday, but our future depends on what we're gonna do tomorrow. Um, a, a question, um, and it ties to finding your audience or finding your customer, or finding the right customer, um, is measurement, how we measure things. And in social media, we have been pushed to think of how many followers or how many shares, or how many likes and, and these metrics. And yet at the end of the day, how many of them are really turning into a likely customer as opposed to, you know, yeah followers. So um, what should we be doing better about how we measure our success? Right. So just because it's easy to measure doesn't mean it's important. Uh, 2001 was a failure when it came out. The Big Lebowski didn't do very well at the box office. I could name 20 movies that over time have become part of the canon, but we measured the wrong things when we were measuring them at first. Measuring how many likes or quote friends you have is foolish because I can buy as many as you want for 250 bucks. That's not a useful measure of anything. So I'm not against measurement. I'm just in favor of measuring the things that actually matter even if they're hard to measure. And then I'm gonna let uh, Erwin uh, do a final question in closing and then we'll sum up. Great, I got, I, I, I'll pick this one. Um, in the passage about um, you don't need any more good ideas, you need more bad ideas. I think, um, you know, I think we're living in this world where um, generationally it used to be you'd see things in a special way. You'd go to a museum to see something. You'd see it in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You'd see things that you couldn't get access to. But now, of course, we live in a world where that information is so prevalent that I find myself more and more seeing things and go, what a great, oh, that's, oh, that, and you know, not, not, I could have done that because I would never say that, but the, that's pretty good. But what you talk about is this idea of um, begin with a genre, understand it, master it, and change it. And there was a, a few passages about this that I just love that reinterpretation of, and I think I always try to say this to creatives too, which is, it's not about this authentic, I'm going to do the one thing, and this is the sculpture or the thing that you're going to go, oh my gosh, that is so great but I'm gonna create the experience. And I, I, can you share the story of, I think it was Annie Dillard and the pennies because I shared that with a bunch of people yesterday. I took screenshots and I was sharing with my artist friends. You've made so many great points uh, in this interview, Erwin. It, it's been so generous. I think we could make a book out of your questions because I they show that. an insight. And that's part of what I'm trying to get at here yeah. is that it used to be that this thing we called art was reserved for the gallery and for the person in the attic and for something that came out every few years. And um, I'm very torn about Marcel Duchamp because he stole from the Baroness Elsa von Freitag yeah. von Hoven. But why are we even talking about Marcel Duchamp 90 years later? Because he did something that led to him being ridiculed. Uh, and then it changed the world of of graphic art. Why did, uh, why do we talk about Stravinsky? After the Rite of Spring in Paris, there were riots because it so undermined what people expected from the work. If you had asked these people, um, are you sure it's going to work? If you had said to Thelonious Monk, are you sure this is going to work? If they were honest, they'd have to say, of course not, but I get to try. And it's the, I get to try part that is so critical because we don't work in a factory anymore. And if you do work in a factory, you're not being treated with the dignity you deserve. We work in a place where it's all flying by ever faster. 
And if you try to fit in all the way, you'll never succeed. But it might be that if you can generously figure out how to stand out and lead, you'll get to do it again. And if you do it enough times, then you get your chance to be lucky. But you don't get to live that life with a smile on your face unless you're unattached from the outcome and committed to the practice. And the people who I know who are taking joy in the work they do and making an impact, that's what they have in common. And so I don't think it matters whether you're at a big company or a little one. I think it matters about whether you're viewing the world through the lens of possibility and abundance or fear and scarcity. And I, for one, like living in a world filled with uh, the former, that we can make things better by making better things. And that's why I do this work. And that's why when an old friend like Ted shows up and says, I get to talk to someone like Erwin, I'm like, count me in because it's contagious. If we can figure out how to just spread it a little bit, maybe it'll spread a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, I want to, I got to thank Ted because thank you for inviting me, but also I've discovered your work. So I, as I said, I bought some other books. I am enthralled. I, I appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and really thank you so much for talking to us about this. I think it's going to mean a lot to the people who are watching. So appreciate it. A pleasure. Thanks uh, to both of you. Uh, thanks Seth for uh, coming back to uh, my series. Uh, thanks Erwin also returning as an interviewer. A reminder to our audience, Seth Godin's new book is The Practice, Shipping Creative Work, and it is available wherever books are sold.